Welcome back to the Fantasy Slant, powered by Pro Football Focus and brought to you by DraftKings.com. I'm your host, Jeff Ratcliffe. Uh, back after a brief hiatus, a nice Memorial Day weekend, and OTAs are in full swing. With me to talk some fantasy football is uh, the great Mike Clay. Mike, getting caught up here, lots going on, but some big stuff going on at the site too, the draft guide just released. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, make sure you pick it up. Uh, we're we're out in front. I think we're the first ones to have it out there. And and some people criticize us for that because they say, "What are you doing? It's only May. We don't need this yet." But we're gonna update it once a month. So why not get it now? Re- read up on the feature articles. Get ahead of everyone else, especially if you're doing MFL tens, dynasty drafts, any of that fun stuff. Uh, we have full coverage in there. Hundreds and hundreds of capsules, feature articles from some of the best in the business. And uh, you know, uh, like I said, we'll be updating it. The uh, the PDF is. Four ninety nine on the site, or it's free if you have your Fantasy Gold subscription, and uh, you get the updates for free. So you know you're drafting September first. We'll have an update late August, and uh, you know you'll have the, the best possible analysis and cheat sheets, all that fun stuff. And of course, you can get the print version too. Looks fantastic this year. You can get that at CreateSpace.com or Amazon.com. That's only seven forty nine. I'll ship it right to your doorstep. So that one, that one you have to pay for the updates, but uh, you know it. it uh, you know they'll they'll send you another print copy. You can't beat it. It's uh it's the best in the business. I'm biased, but uh, it, it came out awesome this year. You know the cool thing though about the actual physical draft guide itself, uh, as opposed to the PDF, is it's an almanac. And even if you get that first copy uh, without some of the text updates, the numbers don't change, Mike. You know it's like it, you want to know how many t- uh, what percentage of the time Emmanuel Sanders lined up in the slot or, or whatever it is, right? All those numbers aren't going to change. And I found myself. Countless times, instead of having to pour through spreadsheets and trying to find this information here or there, I just flip open the draft guide, and boom, all that information is at your fingertips. And it, it's really incredible uh, the amount that we jammed into 111 pages. Yeah, definitely. It's it's. I've actually considered calling it an almanac or an annual just because it's so data-driven. But we do have the capsules in there, and they'll move around. The projections, rankings will adjust based on news, uh, what's going on in training camp, that stuff. So far, you know, since we put it out the other day, Almost zero movement, so uh, you know it's it's still it's still up to date, but you know we'll we'll keep it fresh once a month. You can look for those updates towards the end of each month. Absolutely, uh, a, a huge advantage to have a fresh draft guide going into your draft. Uh, like we said, August update, you really can't beat it. Mike, a lot of things going on though, and I, I get the feeling okay, not much is updated in the draft guide yet, but for our June update, there are going to be some uh, some changes uh, coming our way and. And maybe one of them is in Dallas. You know, a lot of the talk right now, we saw Dallas go out and sign Darren McFadden in the offseason. Never really been the player that we expected, some of us expected him to be as a professional. Certainly game-breaking ability, still younger. I I guess a lot of people are surprised that he's not uh, older than he actually is. But uh, we, we also had... Joseph Randall, an incumbent, after DeMarco Murray left the team. And then the su- uh, surprising move was the Cowboys actually didn't select a running back in the draft. A lot of people thought they were going to, and they haven't brought any veterans in. So, you know, right now, OTAs open up, Mike, and Joseph Randall's receiving the majority of the first team carries over uh, Darren McFadden. So what are we doing to make heads or tails of this? I mean, is it too early to really say anything about this? Uh, or, or is there – potential here in, in places like MFL 10s uh, mm-hmm. to get some value with Randall. Yeah, I definitely think it's worth taking a shot at him. I, I was one of the people like everyone else on the fence, you know, do you lean towards McFadden? We know he's a ton of raw skill. He's a big frame. He's shown it in the past. Can he go behind this Dallas offensive line and have a good quarterback taking the pressure off? Uh, you know, but it, it really doesn't look like that's going to be the case. It looks like Randall's going to get the first shot here. And, I mean, there's a lot to be excited about. I mean, you throw, take every running back in the NFL who had at least 10 carries last season, throw them into a pot. Uh, atop of that pile is Joseph Randall. He averaged 6.7 yards per carry. That was best in the NFL. Uh, of course, he only had 51 carries, and, and he had 54 as a rookie and wasn't particularly good. Um, so there's question marks how good this guy is. But, you know, even if he's a pedestrian talent behind this line in this situation, you know, he and let's just say he gets 230 touches, 240 touches. That'll be enough for flex, uh, flex performance in in standard leagues, and uh, you know, maybe even running back to 
the, the running back two department. If he really goes into preseason and takes control of the backfield, he's going to put up borderline running back one numbers just on volume. It's a high scoring offense, great O line. We've we've talked all about that. So there's just too much to like right now. And where he's going in drafts and late in the later portion, he's worth throwing a dart at. But we'll have to watch Jeff. I mean, it's very possible his ADP will skyrocket now that it looks like he's the top of the depth chart. Yeah, it's interesting looking at the ADP, the current ADP in, in MFL 10s. Now, keep in mind, NFL, MFL 10, we were actually just talking about this before the show. Uh, it's a really informed group of drafters, but still looking at the ADP, McFadden comes in right now in drafts uh, following May 15th, so roughly the last two weeks, at ADP number 33, the 33rd running back off the board. Randall's the 36th. Now, that sort of that it aligns perfectly with where we consensus rank Randall. We have him as our 36th running back, but we have McFadden as our, our 40th. And I do suspect that's going to change. You know, there is potential for some crazy value if you hit if if Randall's the guy and you're you're taking him right now. I mean, that could be some huge value uh, when the season rolls around, but just with the potential behind that offensive line. Yeah, yeah, I. I... I can't add any more, Jeff. <laughs> we, we, we've uh, we've worn That's out our. <laughs> we exhausted it. I, 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 <laughs> there's, there's there's just there's still question marks. We you know we'll we'll see how it develops. But right now, I think uh, you know I think he is the the guy you want to take from that backfield. You want to throw a dart at. You know it, the good news is his his ADP isn't where uh, you know where you'd have to reach on him right now. He's but you know where he's coming. He's he's worth that dart throw. Absolutely, um, and you know that's that's how you win leagues. Is is it's not in the first or second round. It's it's those later round picks that really end up panning out. Um, so you know, keep an eye on that, and we're certainly probably going to revisit this situation as we had <laughs> every um, show. We'll be every, doing an update. <laughs> yeah, it's the five minute Joseph Randall segment of the show. <laughs> um, all right, well, let's move on because there's just – it's amazing. The football season is just so awesome because every week, even in dull weeks, there's 15 things to talk about. And one of the things that actually, you know, really stuck out across the newswire this week, Emmanuel Sanders uh, talking about the new offense. It's a very different offense in Denver than what we saw under the uh, Adam Gase, uh, John Fox regime. And with this Kubiak offense, much more run-driven, right – uh, and Emmanuel Sanders actually said he anticipates a, a drop off in production. So, Mike, I mean, where we currently have him ranked is sort of a borderline wide receiver one. Uh, are you concerned at all? I mean, does this drop his value for you, or or is this just sort of off season fluff? You know, that we just use to pass the time. Well, it's funny. All the stories right now, for the most part, are positive. This is one of the rare negative ones. So whenever there's a negative story about a player, you always want to pay close attention because usually it's everybody getting hyped up. Um, you know, as as for Sanders, you know, and and we talk. It's kind of funny. We talked about you know, uh, may, we may need to update the draft guide in June and July. But I, we're out in front of some of this stuff, Jeff. So you know, we, we won't have to do too much updating. That's why that's why we're the we're the best in the business, right? So. Um, you know, Sanders, we're, we're out in front of this. We, he had 140 targets last year. We have him projected at 127. He caught 101 balls last year. We have 83. He, uh, 1,409 receiving yards last year. We have him at 1150. Nine touchdowns, we have him at seven. So we've already expected him to drop off uh, by, th- what, 35 fantasy points from seventh in the ranks to 12th. Uh, why do we have him uh, like that? I think Denver's going to lean more on the – the uh, running game with Gary Kubiak there and with Peyton Manning taking a, a little bit of a step back late last season and obviously getting up there in age. Uh, you know, they, they have a, a decent running game there with C.J. Anderson. And, you know, with Kubiak, you're going to see more two tight, tight end sets. You're going to still see that focus on Demaryius Thomas, but you also have Cody Latimer emerge, emerging there too. So there's more two tight end sets, or excuse, excuse me, two, more two wide sets. You may see more uh, – Cody Latimer in there in place of Sanders at times if, if he does really take that leap forward and, and we know Latimer has a much higher ceiling than a guy like Sanders so you know is he still a borderline wide receiver one with Peyton Manning under center absolutely uh, but you know I, I just don't think he is that ceiling that we saw from him at, at parts of last season yeah certainly some regression here and you know uh, just as a, an aside you know we pick we're always picking bones uh, a little bit about Gary Kubiak all right we get it <laughs> His offensive line produces good running back numbers, all right? If I have to see one more C.J. Anderson article, <laughs> it's like a couple years ago, remember, Mike, we, we actually had to say, okay, stop writing about Mark, or, the Mark Tressman offense and Matt Forte, mm-hmm. and please don't use the title uh, catching passes is his forte. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's certainly going to be more run run heavy. Um, you know, news now coming out of OTAs, Peyton Manning under center, you know, not taking uh, snaps uh, out of shotgun. And, and so it's going to be a different look from this offense. And, yeah, we absolutely have to expect some regression here. And, and Mike, not one to toot his own horn. <laughs> uh, sure I am. We, That's how we <laughs> make sentinels, Jeff. That's how we sell our product. We absolutely were ahead of the curve on that one. But I, I think our ranking is fair right now. I mean, perhaps maybe, um, you know, maybe we're a tiny high, a bit high. I don't, I don't even think we're that high. I think borderline wide receiver one is, is sort of perfect, uh, a perfect spot to target him. Although I really would, would you want to rely on him as your, as your top wide receiver, your, your number one wide receiver on your team? Well, no, I, I think we've talked about this before. I think you're looking at the top 11 running backs, the top 11 wide receivers, and Gronkowski. I think that's your, your top 23. So, uh, you know, I think if you can get one of them running backs and one of them receivers, or, you know, if you mix in Gronk, fine. Uh, so if you, uh, let's just say, I don't know, you get Arian Foster, you come back with Gronk, or uh, let's say the you're picking towards the end of round one, and somehow you land Sanders there in round three. I mean, you're, you're going to be in pretty good shape with that, uh, especially because wide receivers so deep, you just keep throwing darts at later, like high upside guys like Rashad Perriman. You know, you can always get a guy that like Kelvin Benjamin, he, actually he's going around three, so he doesn't help you. But, you know, Keenan Allen, guy who's going to bounce back. Julian Edelman's st- uh, stock is dropping right now because of the Brady suspension. Vincent Jackson, uh, I love Amari Cooper. I'm sticking with that bandwagon. Uh, Brandon LaFell. I mean, there's just so many uh, guys you can get and, and play some matchups and really have a good core of five, six wide receivers, rotate them in there. You know, three of those guys in that group right now in that middle, the middle of drafts is, is uh, you know, it's very deep right now and you can definitely find some gems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, one of the players too, I mean, even going a little bit deeper, but, you know, just reviewing some of the ADP, uh, right now, Eric Decker is going as the number 38 wide receiver off the board. We have him consensus ranked at number 27. So that means you can get one of those guys you just talked about and somebody like Decker, you know, a little bit later, uh, later on. And I mean, you're absolutely stacked at that point. Uh, so, you know, great value to be had, uh, certainly at this time. And Mike, what's, inter- what's interesting about Decker too is where most have him, it assumes uh-huh. he's behind Marshall on the depth chart. That's not a given. Uh, you know, I, I at first I was thinking Decker, Decker, Decker. I thought about more often. I think Marshall probably gets a little uh, gets a little advantage in the target department as that sort of possession receiver and an offense that's not going to be that good. So I think Marshall probably gets a slight edge there. Um, but it's not for sure. I mean, Decker was really good last year. He's proven that he can do it on his own. So you know, it's not inconceivable that he leads that team in targets, receiving touchdowns, all that fun stuff. Uh, this year, Marshall may even take the press and pressure off and, and make his life a little easier. So uh, that's something to keep an eye on on there with Decker. I, I definitely think, like you said, he's, he's a bit undervalued. Yeah, and I think that's just interesting. While we're on the topic of the Jets, um, it's, it's an interesting situation in general. I mean, a regime, a, another regime change. You know, here we, we hear the Chan Gailey all the time, everybody talking about the offensive coordinator. Uh, but, you know, offensive coordinators are only as good as the talent that's in place on their particular team. So we're looking here and, and uh, you know, one of the news items, uh, silly news items like this always catch my eye just because, you know, how, how, how insignificant it really is. But Brandon Marshall living with Geno Smith, like, ooh, they're, they're roommates, you know. Uh, it's like cue the cheesy 80s sitcom music here. But yeah. <laughs> the question is, is Geno Smith actually going to be under center? I mean, okay, we had Chan Gailey come out and say, He's our quarterback, and then there's a bit of backtracking. Todd Bowles backtracks and says, "Well, wait a minute, now nah, it's 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 more of a competition uh, than maybe we we originally you know led on to believe." So, uh, what you know, what are what are your thoughts with this whole crazy situation? Uh, and does it does it matter ultimately for Decker's fantasy value for Marshall's fantasy value? Uh, who's that quarterback for the Jets? Well, I think it matters because I think Ryan Fitzpatrick is a lot better than Geno Smith. So that's where it, what it comes down to for me. I will say this, though. Eric Decker last year, if you compare his rate stats with Geno Smith compared to his rate stats during his time with Peyton Manning, almost exactly the same, which is which is interesting. He still had success to fight, or excuse me, despite the, the massive drop-off in quarterback talent. Uh, Geno, career 25 passing touchdowns, 34 interceptions. Uh, he's shown nothing on tape that suggests he's better than that. I, I don't think he's very good. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick, perpetually underrated quarterback. I'm not saying he's Peyton Manning, but you know he's a he's a pedestrian back. He's not a bad, or excuse me, a pedestrian quarterback. He's not a bad quarterback. He had 17 touchdowns, eight interceptions last year. 
you know, when when he was uh, um, Chan Gailey's quarterback in Buffalo, he he played. I think it was roughly 97 percent of the dropbacks he handled during Gailey's three years with Buffalo. He finished 17th, 12th, and 17th respectively at quarterback those seasons. You know, he he was a, a decent fantasy performer. He adds points with his legs. Uh, you know, I, I just think Fitzpatrick better. He's going to get more out of this offense. And, uh, you know, and if he does nail down that job or, hey, maybe Geno gets the job to start the season. I think I, I what is it, week five, by something. I made a kind of a, sm a snide remark on uh, on Twitter about this. By like week six, Fitzpatrick should be the quarterback. You know, if you're struggling at that position or you're going quarterback by committee playing matchups, Fitzpatrick may be a gem for you down the stretch last season. We've seen uh, that happened year after year. Josh McCown a couple of years ago uh, fit that kind of bill. You know, Fitzpatrick probably, when he's under center, is going to be in that, you know, 15 range of quarterback most weeks. So uh, I, I don't think Geno lasts long, you know, if he if he does get that week one gig. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, 20 plus touchdowns in each of those three seasons out of Fitzpatrick under Gailey and Buffalo. Uh, last season, actually, too, is, you know, one of the things that he always struggled with was touchdown interception ratio. 17 touchdowns, eight interceptions last year. I mean, hey, eight interceptions isn't lights out, but but a decent uh, ratio, an improved ratio for sure. And two rushing touchdowns as well, too. Absolutely, yeah. He brings that that aspect of his legs. And obviously, you know, okay, he went to Harvard. He's smart. He knows how to play the game. And he, he exceeds his his physical talents with with his, his brain, ultimately. And he knows when to run. And, you know, he's certainly not a, a specimen by any means, but he gets the job done. I get the sense a little bit that this is like, you know, certain players, Mike, you have to say, you have to say, oh, well, you know, he, he's got to earn his way into the, into the first team or, or something like that. And then other players, like, oh, no, he's doing a great job, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that in part, that's what they're, you get a little bit of that for Geno Smith. Like, oh, he's, yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he's doing really well. I swear he got a, 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 a four stars on his report card. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, that, and that happens all the time. You got to, you got to, uh, you know, wade through the the hype in the off season, but this is kind of interesting. You know, and I'm just seeing this as I'm as I'm looking at my board here. But uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick, each of the five last e the e each of the last five years, he's finished as no worse than 24th at among quarterbacks. He's been a quarterback two or that one year he was a one. Each of the last five years, it's kind of hard to believe. You think about where you're ranking him this year. You know, I'm sure some people say, okay, Gino's probably a starter. I'll throw Fitzpatrick will be 35th, 40th. You know, he, he's done it. He's 17th, 12th, 17th, 24th, 22nd over the past uh, past five years. And, you know, I mentioned 2010 to 2012, he was the starter. He handled almost all the snaps there for Buffalo. But the last two years, he has a total of uh, 700, roughly 750 uh, dropbacks. I mean, he was a part-time player with, uh, you know, Houston and Tennessee each of the last two years, and he still was a, a quarterback, too, both of those years. So, you know, something to think about. If the guy, like him or not, he, he gets it done. Yeah, you look at the numbers too. I, I you know, I haven't pulled up his uh, yards per attempt improved last year. His completion percentage improved last year. And again, he's not going to be an elite quarterback on the field. But you don't need that elite quarterback on the field to put up fantasy points for you. You know, and and the proof is in the pudding with this guy. If you're somebody who really likes to stream quarterbacks, or you're going to wait and wait and wait at quarterback, I mean, there's there's certainly potential there, even if he isn't the starter, like Mike said. Uh, he's a player to keep your eye on. So really interesting. And the bold statement by Mike uh, that he's just better than Gino. I like it. Oh, yeah. That's an easy one. All right. Um, you know, Mike, one of the things we've talked about, too, and I, I, it, this is sort of behind the scenes. We've been talking about this for a little while. Uh, and I, I don't know if we might have even mentioned it in that crazy mock draft podcast that we did that was just absolute insanity. But the tight end position. Okay, so you know, I think it's pretty consensus whether you know it's not necessarily the exact same order, but the first five tight ends, maybe six, and then after that point, when you go from whatever seven to boy, almost like thirty, looking down through my list, it's almost as if those the the plateau. It's it's like a flat plateau. It's almost you know there's not that much difference from the seventh, eighth, ninth tight end from the twenty sixth, twenty seventh tight end. And one player that actually stood out there, a player who was actually just in, in the news, was uh, Kyle Rudolph. Well, not big news here. Teddy Bridgewater uh, said he's their, the Vikings' biggest weapon. And, and we're trying to figure out if he meant biggest as in best or biggest as in tallest. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Leave that one open to ambu ambiguity. But, Mike, I wanted your thoughts on the, 
on the tight end position here, uh, and, and maybe some strategies if you do get shut out of those uh, those top five or six tight ends. Yeah, and, and you can definitely wait a while if you do. But, I mean, touching back on, on Rudolph, first of all, you know, he definitely is the biggest. He's 6'6", 259, <laughs> so we have that, that half of it covered. The other half, I mean, it's not really crazy to think about it. I mean, of course, Adrian Peterson, uh, we'll just put him aside for now. It, it, is, it sounds like he'll play. He'll be the feature back. I'm not too concerned about that. But in terms of who Bridgewater is going to be throwing to downfield, what receivers, tight ends, you know, he might might be their best their best option there. I mean, Mike Wallace, say what you want about him. He's been a touchdown scorer. He's been a big play uh, machine. But, you know, he has his struggles as well. You have Charles Johnson there, who we've talked about before. I'm not a, not a big fan. Jarius Wright is underrated, but, you know, he's just a situational guy. Cordero Patterson, who knows what we're going to get out from him. You know, the, he is wide receiver one ceiling, but he could be the next Stephen Hill for all we know. Um, so, you know, it, he seems to like Rudolph. If he gets him the football, he can end up being a, a, a tight end one for sure. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned that tier. I mean, do yourself a favor. You know, if, before you do your draft, sit down and just rank these, the top, like you said, top, uh, we'll say, let's go 35. Top 35 tight ends. You're going to be shocked at how many guys are almost the same, whether it's they're just you just know they're going to finish right around 20th. They're just that boring guy that's going to be there or they have a high ceiling, or they're a young guy about to emerge. But I'm going to do it, Jeff. I'm going to do the drill here, just so you realize what we're talking about. I mean, you go Gronk, then you have that next tier of Graham, Olsen, Kelsey. Then you could say Bennett's probably borderline. He's going to drop off from last year for sure. Then you have old, reliable Gates and Witten in there. And then from there, you have, now think about it, upside, reliability, um, question marks. All these guys have some variation of these. Zach Ertz, Jordan Cameron. Julius Thomas, Larry Donnell, Delaney Walker, Austin Severian Jenkins, Heath Miller, Josh Hill, Jordan Reed, Owen Daniels in Denver now, Charles Clay, Kyle Rudolph, Vernon Davis, Tyler Eifer, Jason Morrow, Dwayne Allen, Kobe Fleener, Eric Ebron, Jared Cook. Uh, you know, Cook, many will laugh at, but hey, he always finishes right around 15th or so. Jacob Tammy, don't forget about him. He's in Atlanta now, favored to, to run the routes there. Max Williams in Baltimore, Dennis Pitta in Baltimore, Ladarius Green, Richard Rodgers, Rob Hausler, top of the board in Cleveland now, Michael Rivera, Troy Nicholas, Clive Walford, and I didn't even mention Garrett Graham, who's the starter in Houston, or Brent Selleck, or Niles Paul, you know, Andrew Corliss. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and you, Like you said, if you miss out on one of the top six, seven guys, you know, is it a big drop? Are you sure you're going to take a hit between Jordan Cameron or Julius Thomas and uh, – Kobe Fleener or Jason Morrow, Tyler Eifert, it's it's not a huge drop-off. So it's just something to think about when you're drafting. You know, don't reach on any of these guys. If you're the first person to take, the you know, a, a tight end after the first handful are off the board, you know, somebody else is definitely going to get a better better value than you are. Yeah. I, it, <laughs> when you hear that list, too, it's just kind of, it, it's insane because mm -hmm. they're all – within a few fantasy points. It has to drop off at some point, right? <laughs> you would think. <laughs> you would but think it, so. <laughs> it's like the Energizer Bunny of uh, positions this year. It just keeps going and going and going. Uh, like, how I'm approaching this. Because, you know, unless I, unless I have that sort of back-end first-round pick, uh, maybe one – well, one-six is as, as far as I'd go being comfortable selecting Gronkowski. But in that range, one-six, one-seven, one-eight, one-nine – uh, if he falls further than that, then I'm absolutely grabbing him. But after that, I don't, I'm not crazy about Jimmy Graham in the third round. So then I'm usually waiting. And so if, if it falls that Olsen is at the right spot or even Bennett, I might grab at the right spot. But after that point, the way I've been doing it, especially in MFL 10s, is I'm really swinging for upside. Now, of course, in that format, you benefit from upside. But I would probably do the same thing in my regular redraft leagues when they start up. So I'm looking more to players like Safarian Jenkins, like potentially Josh Hill, though I think he's a little overvalued right now. Uh, you know, Rudolph would be a player. Amaro uh, would also stick out. Those would be some of the, the names that I would be targeting. I don't know. Are you approaching things the same way? Yeah, I do like Gron Gronkowski just because he stands so far ahead of everyone else. So I'm definitely looking at him, uh, looking at him in round one. Um, you know, sometimes you want to get one, two top running backs or one of the receivers and running backs. So you're not, you're not going to cry if Gronk comes off the board, but he definitely is a fine target, uh, especially in if you're in one of the high stakes league. That's a that's a point and a half for tight ends, no brainer. You know, arguably the number one pick there. 
Um, but I'm with you. I mean, especially if you have deep benches, you could just throw some late-round darts at these guys and, you know, go with Rudolph, Hill, Safarian, Jenkins. If that's your group, you know, probably by week two, three, four, you're going to be like, okay, well, one of these guys clearly has stood out. Maybe another one does. You know, all of them could, and then you have some, some nice trade bait. So, you know, I'd, I'd definitely be focusing on some of these upside guys late in drafts. And, you know, usually I take one tight end, especially if I have a top guy. But if I don't, you know, it's, it's not the worst idea to, to throw a dart at one of these guys because a few of them are definitely going to emerge. Yeah, it's a great strategy. Yeah, really, at almost any position in the late rounds, you, you would rather go that route than, than the sort of safe, uh, low, lower ceiling guy. Mike, real quick, I want to mention our sponsor uh, before we get any further into the show here. Uh, and, of course, it is baseball season. It's a, a lot of other seasons as well. Some awesome basketball right now, uh, NBA Finals coming along. You're not going to be able to play daily fantasy sports in basketball anymore, uh, but you will be able to play baseball. It's baseball season, and huge cash prizes are being won every single day at DraftKings.com, the official daily fantasy sports partner of Major League Baseball. Daily fantasy means no season-long commitments, so you don't have to deal with this sort of strategy of picking upside players. Uh, you can just play one day at a time. Why wait to the end of the season when you can win big right now today? It's like a new season every single day you play, so you're never stuck with poor performances or any of that stuff. Simply pick two pitchers, eight position players, and stay under the salary cap, and you can win huge cash prizes in fact, last season, our buddy Peter Jennings won a million dollars playing fantasy baseball. That's unbelievable. A million bucks at, at DraftKings.com. Hundreds of thousands of fantasy sports fans just like you have cash at DraftKings, so now it's your turn. Hurry up, get over to DraftKings.com and use the promo code PFF to play for free to win part of $300 million being paid out this baseball season. DraftKings.com, the official partner of Major League Baseball. Use promo code PFF. For free entries right now over at DraftKings, get yourself a free entry. That's DraftKings.com. Mike, back to football. And, you know, uh, there's still great content coming out every day on the site. And you actually wrote something that I, I think, it, you know, is, is a really important piece that people need to go out and read uh, in terms of replacement level players. Uh, we, we hear it all the time. You hear Oh, well, you just, you know, hey, Gronkowski's going to miss a few games. You just get a replacement guy, and, and you go from there. Well, yeah, that's that's easy for the people in the industry, the, the savvy veteran fantasy players. But for a lot of people, maybe it's like, well, how exactly do I approach this? And and why do you say this? You know, okay, you're saying this guy's going to miss four games. Well, isn't that a quarter of the season? Um, you know, how can this make sense? And, Mike, what you do here, which is so awesome, is you break it down by numbers and you show how it actually does work. So, um, you know, I, I was hoping maybe you could say a few words of basically your thought process here, maybe break it down a little bit, tease it a little bit so people uh, go over to the site and read the article. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, everyone says, you know, pro football focus is analytic side, a stat side. It's not really the case. It's, you know, we watch the games, we chart everything, we quantify what you're thinking. You know, you say, well, that guy's only good because he's had an easy schedule. We'll we'll tell you if that's true. He's had, you know, he he has a high yards per carry because he runs against a lot of nickel and dime defense. We can answer that question, you know. So you can't we you can't have people out there just throwing that around and it becomes a narrative. Now we can tell you whether or not a guy's a good block or that kind of stuff. That one a little probably a little more subjective than than others, but um, you know that's what we're doing here with replacement value. You know we're quantifying what you can expect to get from a replacement level player while a guy like Tom Brady's out, Le'Veon Bell, Arian Foster. Everyone thinks he's going to get hurt. You know what what can you expect if he does miss two three games from a replacement level player? Todd Gurley, Victor Cruz, Dennis Pitta. Those are the guys I really featured. I used Rob Gronkowski's last two years and as, as an example to show uh, that he was behind Jimmy Graham is really the second most valuable tight end during the 2012 and. 13 seasons in which he sat out, uh, what was it, he missed five games in 2012, and then he missed uh, he missed nine in uh, 2013 from the regular season. Still the second most valuable tight end behind uh, Jimmy Graham those years. Um, and, and that's what we're looking at here. You can figure out what you're going to get from a placement level player at, in a normal sized league, and uh, you add that to the projected points for the player, for example, and I'll use Brady right out of this uh, article. Projected for 12 games, we have him, uh, you know, 226 points. I would rank him 25th at, at the end of season. But you're not going to have zero for that position those four weeks. You're going to put another player in for four games uh, and replacement level, which would be 
a mid-pack quarterback, too. We'll say that tier is pretty deep, Jeff. Jeff, as we know, with guys like Eli Manning, Joe Flacco, you can expect about 65 points over those four weeks. So over you know a full 16 game, set of games, you're going to get 290 points. That's the fifth most at, at the quarterback position. Uh, so you know that's how you have to evaluate Tom Brady. He's still a worthwhile uh, number five, number six quarterback, even though you have to consider things like uh, how much space he's going to take on a bench or a draft pick you um, will have to make to get that that second quarterback. Usually, you won't have to reach to get a, a much better player. So, uh, you know that that's the concept. It's broken down here for all these top guys like Gurley and Foster and, and Bell. And uh, you know, also, and I should mention this. You know, it, it differs based on every situation. So you can go into our custom ranking tool, put your league settings in there, and our our tool now spits out replacement level total points. So if if Bell comes out to in 13 games comes out to 100 points, we'll take your league scoring, determine what replacement level will be in your league, add that on, and, and re-rank him. So, you know, you'll still see him, like, second or third in PPR, even though he's going to miss those three games. And that alone, I mean, that might be worth the, the cost of the subscription in and of itself because nobody else does that, that you can't find this anywhere. And just, you know, how that, that was always the problem for, for, you know, the average fantasy player. How do I quantify this? How do I figure out uh, what the actual value of this player is? And what we see, Mike, and we've seen, how many times have you seen it? How many times have I seen it? Where players fall significantly further down than they, they really should, where you can just scoop value. I mean, crazy value when you actually think about it. Um, you know, getting a player uh, of... Uh, now, it's not going to happen with Le'Veon Bell this year, but it, it, it certainly could happen with Tom Brady. It could happen. It happens every year, it seems like, with Arian Foster. He slips... Uh, a few more spots down than he actually should last year. I mean, it really went way too far. Uh, that Yahoo Friends and Family League, I ended up getting him in the third round, and that's a 14 team with industry folks. So, you know, the hate goes too far on some of these guys. And when you use that custom ranker, I mean, that that's just an amazing tool. It's a secret weapon that, that's going to help you dominate the draft. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I think it's awesome. And, and like you said, it's, you're just not going to find it anywhere else. It's baked right into our projections now. So, you know, I often get the question, why, do, you know, I sort your projections and they come out with a guy here, but then I look at your rankings and a guy's here. Well, that this will kind of cover a lot of that too. This is one thing that we have to, we've always had to manually bake into our rankings when looking at the projections. Now it kind of does the work for us. I mean, there's still going to be a difference between rankings and projections because you have to look at upside and risk as well. Bust risk, you know, how safe is a guy? Uh, floor ceiling, we we go through all that. That that allows us to tweak the numbers a little bit uh, when we're when we're adjusting our rankings. But you know, this does cover one of those factors that in the past we just haven't been able to do. Yeah, it's it's awesome stuff. So uh, certainly, you know, if you haven't checked that out, if you haven't checked out the the custom ranking tool, just mess around with it. I mean, it's just it's neat to to import your scoring settings and and just see what what comes out based on uh based on your unique settings. So. Um, great work, great work there from Mike. Uh, that's definitely a must, uh, must read uh, for everybody. So head to the site and check that out. Mike, coming down the stretch here, but there are still some topics I wanted to get to. Um, and, and I guess the, the one thing, we've been talking about this over the last couple shows, and, and it really is not going to get old anytime soon as rookie running backs because this class is just oozing with talent and potential fantasy value, of course, in the same right. Um, and, and so right now we're looking at a couple different situations, but we'll start in Atlanta, you know, OTA is upon us and OTA is open up for the Falcons under a new regime, another team with a new regime, but, uh, Devante Freeman opens up with the ones, uh, Tevin Coleman with the twos. And, um, you know, I think this is pretty interesting because, you know, Coleman's a player who a lot of people like right now. Uh, I've sort of, I've soured a little bit on him based on the landing spot, but, you know, we know there's a lot of potential with Kyle Shanahan's offense. We saw it last year with two rookies, uh, especially Isaiah Crowell, doing pretty well last year with the Browns. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on what's playing out here. Uh, do you anticipate this sticking or maybe a 50-50 RBBC or, or something else here in Atlanta? Yeah, I mean, it's a new offensive coordinator in, uh, in Atlanta, but I think you're going to see a similar sort of usage at running back, and they rotated a lot last year. You saw Steven Jackson leading the way, but you saw a lot of Jacquez Rogers in there and passing down. Same thing with Fonta Freeman, and you saw, uh, had some uh, Anton Smith in there on, uh, on the early downs uh, mixed in there as well. You know, we joke about him, maybe the best running back in NFL history on small sample. He's just <laughs> ridiculous how 
every time he touches the ball, it seems to be an 80-yard touchdown somehow. I don't know how he does it. Um, but I, I do think people are kind of overlooking Smith a bit. I think Shanahan is going to have to have looked at the tape and the numbers and say, okay, we have to give this guy at least four or five touches a game. Um, so that's something to think about. But at the top, I think Coleman's going to emerge there. You know, they handpicked him this year. I think he'll probably have an advantage around 100 carries by year's end over a guy like Freeman. Freeman, you know, he'll still go over 100 carries. I think that he'll probably catch more footballs than, than Coleman will. That's probably one of the areas he needs to work on. Freeman will be that change of pace, passing down guy. And uh, that being the case, I think standard leads you're looking at a guy you want on the bench, uh, you know, a borderline, a borderline flex option. PPR a little higher, maybe he's worth a little bit of PPR consideration, but at that point you're, you're flooded with wide receiver, so you're probably going to go elsewhere. Coleman, borderline running back two in both formats, so that's kind of how I look at him. The ceiling there is high that he can really emerge into a, a star player, uh, but also very risky as well. This may be a guy that's just not up to the task. He's, he was so reliant on big plays at the college level, so uh, time will tell. We'll see how the, the offseason goes, but if I'm picking now, that's where I have those guys ranked. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, An- Anton Smith is uh, the running back version of Chris Carter. You know, all he does is score touchdowns. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I-, I think that in some ways with Freeman, he- he's kind of maybe a-, a slightly better Jacquez Rogers is, is sort of how I, I anticipate uh, his usage this year. And, and you're know, right. I- even though I'm not as high on Coleman as, as everybody else is, um, I, I do think your your evaluation is fair. I think he is going to emerge as their their uh, top running back. I'm, I'm hesitant to say lead running back. Uh, it wouldn't shock me if he does, you know, maybe get into that that role. But I, I, it's still going to be a bit of a committee here, like we saw last season in, in Cleveland as well. Uh, we saw a little bit of back and forth um, with how they use their running backs under Shanahan. So uh, I, I would really kind of be hesitant. I, I like ceiling with young players. But I would be hesitant to have to enter the season with Coleman as my my second running back. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm probably I'm probably less or I'm probably more comfortable with him than you are. I guess uh, you know I I think it, yeah, well listen I have a, a borderline running back too. So I think that I would I wouldn't be you know I, I feel like I have Jonathan Stewart a little bit right there with him, but you know he's like bore, more boring. You know I'm not as excited about Jonathan Seward as some. I feel like Coleman at least you have that chance for a guy that explode into a, a star at some point during the season and really get you over the hump and, and carry you come you know playoff time like a Jeremy Hill did last year. So you know I'm back and forth. I'm worried about him, but to me he's just one of them boomer bust guys. But really backtracking to Anton Smith in case you know you're not overly familiar with him. He only had five carries in 2013, 145 rushing yards, two touchdowns. It's an average of 29 yards per carry. <laughs> uh, last year, he had, he got more work. He had 23 carries for 144 yards and two touchdowns. He averaged 6.3 yards per carry, which is off the charts. He also had 13 receptions for 222 yards and three touchdowns. That's an average of 17.1 yards per reception. This guy, you know, he's 29. You know, he's been around the, you know, for a while, a journeyman. But whenever he seems to be on the field, he he makes big plays. So. You know, only played 90 snaps last year for 25 in 2013. I'm hoping, you know, Shanahan doesn't just throw him away. I'd like to see him get some more work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he's one of those players that maybe you don't want to rely on, um, you know, in a, a, a full season type league, but he, he's certainly a DFS type player if I've ever seen one. You know, <laughs> chuck him in your lineup as a swing for the fences in, in one of those big tournaments. And, uh, you know, obviously we see you can hit home runs for sure. Um, so, you know, definitely interesting situation in Atlanta. Uh, also interesting situation in Jacksonville. You know, we're talking again, rookie running backs. Well, TJ Yeldon, uh, signed the contract and looks like he's in, in a position where he could be a feature back this season. So, you know, where I'm a little down on Coleman, I, I, you know, I'm not on, I'm not necessarily feeling the same way about Yeldon. I'm, I'm pretty excited despite the offense is obviously nowhere near the the caliber of what we'll see in Atlanta uh, with with the Jacksonville offense, but still, I, I do like the potential of Yeldon here. Yeah, I mean, I, I like him a lot. He's only twenty one. Um, you know, I, I don't think that he's going to be a big factor as a receiver, a blocker. Maybe with time, he'll he'll jump up there. But we've seen a guy like Marshawn Lynch, uh, Alfred Morris, guys like that have strong fantasy careers without doing a ton. Uh, as a as a pass catcher, frankly, Lynch really has never. Uh, frankly, Adrian Peterson hasn't either. He hasn't been uh, a big factor as a receiver. I think that changes this year with Norv Turner there. But Yeldon, I mean, he's going to be the feature back. He should go over 250 touches. 
he's going to score six, seven, eight touchdowns, especially maybe more if that offense gets a lot better here in year number two of, of Blake, the Blake Bortles era. Um, you know, I, I don't think Yeldon has a ton of competition. Denard Robinson showed flashes, but I think he's best served as a change of pace guy. Yeldon's going to get the goal line work. Uh, I just think there's a lot to, to like about him. And uh, what did we say before the show? I think he's getting drafted around 30th right now among running backs. To me, that's a steal. I think, uh, you know, get him now because that ADP is going to skyrocket. People are going to start to figure out, you know, why is this guy going that low? He's the lead back in, in Jacksonville. Maybe they're afraid of what happened last year with Toby Gerhardt. I don't know, but Yeldon is is a much better player, and this offense is going to be better this year than they were last year. They were dead last in touchdowns. They, they only have one direction to go, uh, and they have made improvements to that squad. So, uh, you know, I, Yeldon, I have 19. I think he's top 20 back, and, and I feel comfortable with him as my number two. I've been getting him as a flex, Jeff, so uh, I'm, I'm happy with that in standard leagues. Absolutely, yeah. You get the, the upside at flex. You can't beat that. You know, you mentioned Lynch real quick, and I just wanted to bring uh, a couple numbers out. You know, and if you've been paying attention to the main side of the site, you know, you're reading the articles from all the, all the staffers over there, which are awesome content all the time. But we just went through our top 101 players. And you mentioned Marshawn Lynch. And just to put things into context with Lynch, this really kind of blew, blew my mind as I, I read through our write-up on him. But he had the lowest yards before contact, 1.6 yards before contact, of all the 1,000-yard rushers in the league last year, which means, you know, translation – that he got the least help. He had to do the most work uh, out of all these running backs. It really highlights just how good he is uh, as a running back. He caused 88 missed tackles last year, which is the highest number that we've recorded since PFF started grading. So uh, really amazing stuff. And, and a good segue because, Mike, uh, apparently the next coming of Marshawn Lynch is in Washington. With it, I, I heard he's your favorite player, Matt Jones. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know what's going on here. I, I went back and forth with Evan Silva at Roto World because they've they've had so many posts on Matt Jones for some reason, um, you know. And it's not their fault. It's just the hype coming out of training camp is is ridiculous with this guy. But you know, I, I don't really understand it. Um, you know, we you mentioned the main side of PFF. We had the the oh, I think it was eleven guys who were overdrafted, and he was certainly on that list, being a third round pick. Uh, Washington, they're looking for, <coughs> excuse me, looking for a replacement for Roy Hulu on passing downs. Roy Lou, pretty good player. Matt Jones, I don't know what they're looking at in round three. I mean, there was a lot of good running backs on the board when they took him, and he was not good at Florida. I know there's every excuse in the book out there about how bad that team was around him, but, you know, he we, that, that's the point of PFF. We, you know, grade each player individually. It's not a perfect science. It's hard to do sometimes when, you know, their guys are getting destroyed at the line. You can't really give them a plus grade if they can't get out of the backfield. I understand that, but he just was not good as a rusher. He was not good as a receiver. He was not good as a blocker. So, you know, I, I don't think he's, he's a threat to Morris at all. I wouldn't be worried. In fact, Morris's ADP is dropping now. I think he's going to the fourth round value pick right there. I would not be worried about Jones threatening. He'll probably catch some passes just because he's, they're going to give him that role. But it wouldn't surprise me if he just, you know, struggles in his rookie season and ends up, you know, as a, as a journeyman player. Yeah, and, and this is one of those things. You know, we talked about the narrative, uh, the, the news that came out about Emmanuel Sanders. It was negative news, and we're like, ooh, well, maybe we should be paying attention to this. But this is a time of year – Every quarterback is, who has uh, problems with their mechanics ha is looking phenomenal right now. They all look like uh, Joe Namath, and they're winging the ball around the field. Everybody looks great. Tim uh, Tebow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Tim Tebow, he's the, uh, the next coming of Dan Marino at this point. You know, th yeah. that's what we get at this time of year, and we're getting this with Jones. Oh, oh he looks better than the, t uh, the team expected or more versatile than the team expected. Okay, well – they drafted him in the third round. Then how good does this guy look? Are you, you know, like <laughs> you can't take this stuff for real. And, and Mike, you point out probably the best point that we can make about all this, this phony news that comes out at this time of year is it impacts ADP of other players and you can get value out of it. So, you know, pay close attention here because, you know, I, I agree 100% everything I've seen of Jones going back, reviewing uh, his tape from last year, the year before, Nothing special, right? Nothing really special at all. And I don't see this guy being this Marshawn Lynch clone or whatever they want to call him. Uh, I just – I don't see it happening. I certainly don't see how he replaces Halu as a passing down back. But uh, either way, you know, keep that in mind, especially if you're having your rookie drafts coming up. Actually, uh, we'll have our staff rookie draft coming up too uh, pretty soon here in our, our Dynasty League. So maybe we'll uh, clue people into the, the goings-on of, of that draft. Uh, when that takes place, Mike, one more topic here before we get out of here. And it's, it's, I always, you know, draft kickers last, well, we saved the kicker topic for last year. 
the extra point, okay, well, now what is it? Uh, is it 33 yards? Uh, the thir- is it a 33 yard field goal? Is that right? Back to the 15, I think. Yeah, yeah, 33 yards, yeah. 33 yards. Um, does this impact anything uh, at all for fantasy purposes? I mean, it's obviously going to have some impact in, in games. I mean, we're going to see games that are decided by one point now, potentially, even though the accuracy is still going to be over 90% from there. It's not 99%. But uh, does this do anything for us in fantasy purposes at all? Uh, very little. I, I discussed this with Nate. He does our kicker projections. I do the two-point conversions, obviously, for the offensive player. So um, he, he dropped uh, extra point tries by 5%. I, so I increased two-point conversions by uh, less than that, obviously, because you know not all two-point conversions are going to be converted. Uh, and, that, and that's what all we did. So if you were looking at a projection page, uh, rate before we updated and then we updated and you hit refresh, you know, you might see like, oh, that's zero turn to a one right there for Aaron Rodgers or something in the two-point conversion column. Otherwise, you're going to see almost no difference. Uh, we don't expect anything significant. Chip Kelly, he's one of them guys you think, yeah, maybe he'll, you know, throw a wrench in there and just go for two all the time. He's the kind of guy that might do that. Today, they asked him about it. He said he it makes zero impact to him. It's exactly the same. They should still, kickers should still make 98.5% or so of their extra points from that spot. You have to keep in mind, uh, you know, they're already pretty much that accurate. Usually you'll see field goal percentages, but it includes on the hash marks. These guys will be able to either pick their spot or kick from down the middle, and they're going to be practicing this a lot more often too. So, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, efficiency on those is going to be in that 98.5% to 99% range, and I don't expect teams to go for two significantly more often, maybe just a few percentage points. So I I don't think it makes an impact on fantasy. I wouldn't be thinking about it on all at all when uh, – when, when drafting. Yeah, kickers right down the middle. Um, what was that, 98.5% or something like that last yeah. year? Uh, it'd be interesting if they actually did it more like rugby where you you know, you, pl- you, you actually kicked from the, the hash mark of the, or wherever you, you crossed it, the goal line, you know, at least as far out as the hash mark goes. Uh, that would make it a little bit more difficult, but um, it's still, it's almost an automatic field goal for these guys, or a kick, I should say, for these guys. Uh, it's, it's still a chip shot. If it's me, I would, you know, and just my two cents here, I'd give seven points for touchdowns. If you want to go for two, you get six. You go for the two from the two-yard line, same as same as now. So that's me. That's my two cents. That's what I That's what I would do. And if it was me, I would have one guy on my team who could punt and kick field goals. I, I you know, we have we put a we put a man on the moon, Mike, and we don't we have, we don't have a guy who can do both. I mean, McAfee's probably the closest in the league to yeah. it. But it, it blows my mind, uh, this specialist. J.J. I, I Watt could do it. Of course. Well, <laughs> hey, and by the way, we be- completely buried that lead. The Texans on uh, hard knocks, which is pretty exciting oh, for right. football fans everywhere. That's, that's going to be really interesting to see the behind the scenes, see the personalities, J.J. Watt, see some of the other players on that squad, the quarterback battle. You get to see this uh, young or newer coach. Uh, it's pretty exciting. So uh, exciting stuff coming up for uh, football fans everywhere there. Absolutely. Now All right. Buy our draft guide. Buy our draft guide. <laughs> subscribe to the site, uh, and better yet, do so. Uh, you know, by opening up a, an account at DraftKings. Uh, but head to the site, read the content. If you're not subscribing to the podcast, make sure you are. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes. You can also listen to us on Stitcher or Blog Talk Radio. You can watch us on YouTube and the Fantasy Sports Network. Uh, and of course, follow us on Twitter. He is at Mike Clay NFL. I'm at Jeff Ratcliffe. The show is at PFF Radio and at PFF Fantasy underscore Fantasy. Uh, so make sure you're doing that. And we'll be back here next week with another show. Uh, so for Pro Football Focus, he's Mike. I'm Jeff, and that's a wrap.